right. Thank you again for joining us. Um, this is Breast Cancer Action's webinar, Take Back Our Genes, Ending the Patents on Breast Cancer Genes. My name is Saru Kaiser, and I'm the Education and Mobilization Coordinator at Breast Cancer Action. On the webinar today, our presenters will be Karuna Jagger, Executive Director of Breast Cancer Action, Sandra Park, Staff Attorney at the ACLU's Women's Rights Project, and Rudy, Rooney excuse me, Limery, a breast cancer survivor and plaintiff in the ACLU's case challenging gene patents. A few quick announcements before we get started. Our webinar will last about 45 minutes and we'll save time at the end for questions. Everyone except the presenters will be muted to cut down on background noise. Also, please feel free to type in a question in the question box that pops up on your screen and we'll be keeping track of those questions and we'll answer them at the end. Also, we want you to get involved with Breast Cancer Action. This webinar is a great way to do that. Please stay tuned for other ways we'll mention later on. So before we go over our agenda, I just want to um, state a few goals for the webinar today. Um, our goals for the webinar are that we um, that you will have a chance to hear about important facts about the BRCA genes, that you'll also have a chance to understand the harms of Myriad's patents, and also why this issue is important for all women. So to that end, we'll start our agenda with Karuna, who will give a brief description on what gene patenting is and why breast cancer action opposes them. She'll also discuss why it's important for all women and its impact on underserved communities. Sandra will give us an understanding of the current status of the ACLU's lawsuit challenging the legality of patents on human genes and where we go next. And last, Rooney will share her story of how breast cancer gene patenting has impacted her life. And last, we'll conclude with next steps. Also during the webinar, we will intersperse testimonials from our members that they shared with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office a few months ago to understand women's experiences with gene patenting. Breast Cancer Action was founded in 1990 by a group of women who were frustrated with the lack of information about breast cancer. Our founders, only one of whom is still alive today, knew that their private medical crises were part of a larger public health emergency and that the experiences of those dealing with breast cancer needed to be heard to address the crises. Breast Cancer Action's mission is to carry the voices of people affected by breast cancer to inspire and compel the changes necessary to end the epidemic. Our advocacy is conducted through a social justice lens because the politics and policies of breast cancer disproportionately affect poor women and women of color. Breast Cancer Action's independence from pharmaceutical company funding puts us in a unique position to address issues of health equity and exposures to toxins in our environment, and to put the needs of patients before pharmaceutical company profits. We have three main program priorities. The first is putting patients first, where we advocate at the Food and Drug Administration in favor of treatments that are less toxic, more effective, and less expensive than those already available. We also provide information about breast cancer to anyone who needs it. The second is creating healthy environments where we work to reduce the involuntary exposures people encounter that put them at risk for breast cancer by holding corporations accountable for unhealthy products and practices. We also support legislation that would better protect us from chemicals in our environment and that would make personal care products safer. And the last is eliminating social inequities related to breast cancer where we work to create awareness that it is not just genes, but social injustices, political, economic, and racial inequalities that lead to disparities in breast cancer incidence and outcomes. Our first presenter is Karuna Jagger. Karuna joined BC Action as Executive Director in early 2011, bringing a professional expertise in applied research and policy advocacy to her personal commitment to addressing and ending the breast cancer epidemic. Throughout her 15-year career in nonprofit leadership and capacity building, Karuna's work has focused on women's rights and eliminating socioeconomic inequities. Next, we have Sandra Park. 
Sandra is a staff attorney with the ACLU's Women's Rights Project. Founded in 1972 by now Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the ACLU Women's Rights Project works to secure gender equality and ensure that all women and girls are able to lead lives of dignity, free from violence and discrimination. Sandra engages in litigation, policy advocacy, and public education at the national, state, and local levels to advance the rights and civil liberties of women and girls. She previously worked at the Legal Aid Society in New York City as a Skaden Fellow and clerked for U.S. District Court Judge Alvin K. Hellerstein in the Southern District of New York. She is a magna cum laude graduate of New York University School of Law and Harvard University. And our last presenter is Rooney Limery. Rooney was diagnosed with invasive breast cancer in 2005 at 28 years old. She underwent surgery, chemotherapy, targeted therapy, and hormone therapy. She was a NASA training project scholar and graduated summa cum laude with a Bachelor of Science degree in education from the University of New Mexico. She has many years of working in the breast cancer community and works with college students and other community groups to educate them about breast cancer issues. Now I'd like to introduce Karuna Jacker. Well, I'm really pleased to be doing this webinar today, and thank you so much to Sandra and Rooney for joining us. So what are these BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes? Um, they're often pronounced BRCA, so you'll hear us using that. The first thing to understand is that all of us have BRCA genes. Men, women, uh, whether mutated or not, we all have BRCA genes. And there are are some differences between the BRCA1 and 2 genes. Both genes belong to a class of genes known as tumor suppressors. They're responsible for the repair of spontaneous breaks in DNA, which occur throughout our lives due to ongoing damage. Now, some families have mutations in the BRCA genes that can affect the gene's ability to perform their usual function. In particular, carriers of these hereditary mutations have an elevated risk for breast, ovarian, and some other cancers. You may be surprised to know that one company, Myriad Genetics, owns a patent on the actual BRCA1 and 2 genes. Now, people often ask for clarification, and yes, I do mean they have a patent not only on the test, but on the genes themselves. And this patent and the resulting harms to women's health is the topic of today's webinar. So I'm going to take just a moment to talk to you about the invention of the BRCA genes. And really, the key point is to recognize that Many international researchers use breast cancer genes. Um, evidence for the BRCA1 gene was discovered in 1990 by Dr. Mary Claire King at UC Berkeley. Dr. King had spent nearly 15 years of working to identify a genetic marker associated with hereditary breast cancer. And I think it's interesting to note that Dr. King is also famous for proving that humans and chimpanzees share 99% of genes. So after assessing nearly 200 possible markers in 1990, Dr. King and her research team found the right gene on chromosome 17 that's responsible for a number of different hereditary uh, breast and ovarian cancers. Dr. King's discovery made it possible for others to then pinpoint the specific cancer-causing gene itself, now known as BRCA1 in Utah, the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, and some other institutions, uh, including Eli Lilly, announced they had sequenced the BRCA1 gene in 1994. BRCA2 on chromosome 13 was identified in 1995 by a team of researchers in the United Kingdom. In addition to the federal funding that went into Dr. King's research at the University of Berkeley, the research which Myriad was a part of researchers and about $2 million to the University of Utah for this research. So in total, about a third of the total funding used to identify BRCA1 publicly funded by the federal government. Myriad has then gone on to patent the BRCA1 gene. A patent is basically a limited monopoly granted by the government determining sole use of an invention and allowing the patent holder to stop rivals from making, using, or selling this invention without permission. It's worth noting that patents control use and patents themselves can be bought, sold, rented, or hired. As we'll see, Myriad is particularly restrictive with their patents. Of course, not everything is patentable. Patents are granted for inventions, not discoveries, and they're typically granted for things, typically not granted for things that occur in nature. Sandra is going to talk more in the next section about the technical aspects of patents and our legal challenge to Myriad's claims.
Right now, Myriad has a patent on the BRCA1 and 2 genes, and as a result, Myriad also holds a monopoly on testing for mutations, to related, mutations related to breast cancer. This has real implications for women and for research. Myriad Genetics is the only source of testing in the United States compared to five options in Germany or 10 options in Australia. This monopoly means that Myriad sets the cost of the test, there is no second opinion, and there's no independent verification for tests. In short, there is no competition for price or for product. According to a New York Times article by Andrew Pollack published in August of 2011, Myriad's BRCA analysis test, commonly known as the breast cancer test, accounted for $353 million in revenue. This represents 88% of Myriad's $402 million in revenue in the 2010-2011 fiscal year, which ended in June of 2011. You can see this patent is vital to Myriad and the company's profits, and the company is invested in both retaining the patent as well as using the patent to acquire trade secrets that will produce future profits. So I want to talk about what it means when one company owns a patent on our genes. As I began our pres my presentation, all humans have the BRCA genes. Yes, on a highly technical level, the structures of the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes are very different, but these key functions are interrelated. Both genes are involved in the repair of DNA. Going back to basic biology, DNA is actually a pair of molecules that are tightly held together and entwined in a double helix. The DNA strands are continually breaking from damage through our daily lives. Sometimes one strand is broken, and sometimes both strands are broken simultaneously. When those double strand breaks occur, it's hard for the repair mechanism to make the repair with the correct DNA sequence because there are multiple ways to attempt a repair. If the error is so bad, sometimes that cell will die. Both BRCA genes play an essential role in the repair of these double strand breaks in DNA. The BRCA genes also destroy cells if the DNA cannot be repaired, including breast and ovarian cancer. Now, it's important to note that the BRCA genes are not cancer genes, as sometimes claimed. The gene doesn't cause cancer, but rather it creates a vulnerability in the repair mechanism. Not everyone with the mutation will get cancer. It's been estimated that if a woman lives to age 70, as many as 85% of women with a BRCA1 mutation will get breast cancer. That still means that 15 or more percent will not get breast cancer. And I want to take a moment here to recognize that all, excuse me, that not all mutations have been identified, and the significance of some mutations is unknown. We'll talk more about what happens when there is an ambiguous mutation. Most breast cancers are not linked to hereditary disease. Current estimates are that 0.1% of women, that's roughly one in a thousand women, carry a BRCA mutation, and that inheritance of BRCA mutations accounts for just 5 to 7% of all breast cancers. I want to acknowledge the importance of this research on the BRCA genes for families with hereditary breast and ovarian cancers. The identification of these genes and the ability to be tested for mutation are huge advances for some women and their families. However, Myriad's patents on the gene produces measurable harms that I'll now turn to. So here at Breast Cancer Action, we've heard from many women about the ways that Myriad's patent impacts their health and lives. I'm going to share a number of member testimonials throughout this presentation, and I'm going to start with this one from Mona Verducci, who says, my health insurance did not want to pay for the tests, but I knew that the results of the tests would determine which types of surgeries and treatments would provide me with the best chances of survival. I paid a great deal of money out of pocket and spent a great deal of time and energy in fighting my insurance company. And I never had more extensive testing, which would have further helped in determining appropriate adjuvant therapy in my situation. This was a great disservice to me, and ultimately probably led to unnecessary and expensive treatments, which had significant toxic side effects. I see we're having a lag. Okay. 
I want to acknowledge the importance of the work leading up to and following the discovery of the BRCA genes in the early 1990s. Again, for families with hereditary breast cancer, the work of these scientists, researchers, and clinicians on the BRCA gene has been invaluable. However, there are two fundamental reasons we oppose a patent on the BRCA gene itself. First, we believe genes are products of nature and are not themselves patentable. Furthermore, we believe that the patent materially harms public interest in a couple of key ways. We're concerned that the patents stifle innovation rather than rewarding it, as commonly claimed. And we're concerned about harms to patients that include restricted access to genetic tests, second opinions, and limitations on current tests. Our work at Breast Cancer Action to Oppose Gene Patents is another way that we are working to put patients before profit. Myriad's patent of the BRCA genes mean that many women are not able to access this important genetic information about possible hereditary breast cancer risk. The monopoly on the commercial test means Myriad's current BRCA analysis test is too costly, incomplete, and technically outdated and biased for women of color. Not all women are equally harmed by this patent. Some things, excuse me, sometimes things go dramatically wrong when women are unable to get the information they need. Other times it seems that things have worked as they should. Women are able to access the test, hopefully insurance paid, and they got a clear result about whether or not they have a known mutation. But even in these seemingly based scenarios, there are important ways that gene patents harm women, including possible removal of healthy organs in order to reduce risk. Additionally, we all suffer with their impediments to potentially life-saving research. And I'll talk more about each of these harms from Myriad's patents on the BRCA genes. We've already talked some about the ways that Myriad's monopoly on genetic testing limits competition and drives up the cost of the test. The result is that too many women can't access this expensive test, and I want to take a moment to go into the specifics. Currently, Myriad Genetics BRCA analysis tests cost approximately $3,500 with a supplemental BRCA analysis large rearrangement test for BART, we'll talk more about that, costing an additional $700. Not all health insurance providers, including some state Medicaid programs, cover the cost of the Myriad test. Even if the BRCA analysis by insurance or covered in part, the BART test is not always covered, and the inability to pay for the each insurance company must negotiate with Myriad individually. And we hear too many stories of women, including Breast Cancer Action members, whose insurance did not have a contract for services for the test. For most women without health insurance, the test is just out of reach. According to the Department of Health and Human Services, that number is more than 17 million women between the ages of 18 and 64. Uninsured and underinsured women deserve to have the same opportunity to access testing that women with insurance coverage have. It's important to note that these high prices do not have for the same genetic mutations for only a few hundred dollars. We'll talk more about this towards the end. Apologies for the lag here. Although I have insurance from my employer, which is a major airline, the $3,800 cost of the test was not going to be covered because of contractual exclusion in my coverage. This means that no amount of medical documentation will get insurance to cover the fee. I could not afford the $3,800, so I put off having the test done for two years, thereby increasing my chances of developing a number of cancers. So let's look at what it means when mutations are missed or not understood. We'll hear later in the webinar from Rudy Limery about what happens when she received an ambiguous test result from her genetic testing. Rooney gives a very personal account of how harms related to Myriad's gene patent affect her personally. For now, I want to share some of the history and context. So starting mid-1990s, mutation analysis was done on a little over 1,000 Ashkenazi Jewish women with a family history of breast or ovarian cancers in New York. Because this early mutation identification for other populations, we've already discussed certain bracket mutations that are found mostly in those in Latin American or Caribbean ancestry, excuse me, uh, are not picked up by myriad standard bracket tests. Significance. 
myriads can be indeterminate. That is to say, they can identify a mutation without acknowledgement whether that mutation is clinically significant or whether it has a demonstrated link to an increased risk of cancer. These indeterminate proportionally affect women of color. What are women supposed to do when the test results are unclear? Should they have prophylactic surgeries? And will their insurance cover increased screenings? Clearly relating accuracy and the limitations in what the test can detect. Because of Myriad's patent, it's been difficult to assess the accuracy of the BRCA analysis test. This brings us to the fact that independent second opinion testing is not widely available, if at all. Indeed, many people are shocked to realize that the FDA does not regulate genetic testing. Without the option of a second opinion, women are unable to validate of their genetic testing. For a time, Myriad reported that this method resulted in high risk the test is known to be expensive, incomplete, and technologically outdated. Particularly out of these limitations, women want access to second opinions and test validation. I'm going to pause for a moment while the slides catch up. Or just lag, excuse me. Illness. It's I'm a young person who was diagnosed with breast cancer last year. I had to pay five hundred dollars out of pocket for one test and I could not afford the second three thousand dollar test, which was not covered by my insurance. Because there's only one company that can do this test, there's no way to go for a second opinion, which I consider a crucial part of the whole battling breast cancer process. It is a costly, scary, and sensitive disease, and I wanted to be sure that I was armed with the best information at every turn. I did not have this option with regard to genetic testing. At the end of the day, we all lose when there are impediments to research. Indeed, we're reminded that the BRCA genes were discovered through international collaboration and concurrent research. While there are those who argue that patents drive innovation, there's significant evidence challenging that assumption. And I want to be clear that Myriad's patent on the gene itself is unique in its important ways in which it, uh, it locks up the information. Sandra's going to talk more about this. In addition to being highly restrictive with its patent, Myriad is using the patent to collect trade secrets. Because it has done so much more testing than anyone else, Myriad has more information on which of the thousand possible mutations in the two genes actually raise the risk of getting cancer. Myriad used to share such information with a public database maintained by the National Institutes of Health, and it used to cooperate with academic scientists trying to analyze mutations. But a few years ago, the company quietly stopped contributing and cooperating in favor of building its own database. Again, a Breast Cancer Action member writes, to patent the gene itself or the gene variables simply because someone has found it and consequently, to have the right to keep that information from other doctors and scientists is not only immoral, exploitative, and predatory, but it flies in the face of the current medical precedents regarding the study of life-threatening diseases. Accepting this attempt to patent genes themselves would be the first step to impeding scientific access to problem solve. None of us, not someone with a BRCR1 or 2, she means mutations, or someone like myself who's fighting a completely different genetic disorder benefit from that. A broader problem is the impact gene patents are having on research agendas. The Department of Health and Human Services Secretary Advisory Committee on Genetics, Health, and Society found that patents are in fact not needed for labs to develop genetic tests, and there are other motivating factors that actually lead to these inventions, which benefit patients and science. Even so, the in industry argues that patents are necessary for them to develop tests and conduct research on genes. What this does is drive research into what is patentable and away from the actual causes of disease and environmental factors that lead to increased risk for diseases. While companies cannot patent discoveries, for example, that certain chemical exposures are linked to breast cancer, and there's no pharmacological profit from identifying environmental solutions to a disease, Indeed, we see that these areas are largely understudied and underfunded in today's research agendas.
In a moment, I'm going to turn it over to Sandra to talk about the legal challenges to Myriad's gene patent. But I want to end by asserting that we all suffer when women cannot access testing. We suffer when the test fails to provide conclusive evidence about a particular mutation. We suffer when women of color are disproportionately impacted. And we suffer when second opinion testing is not accessible. We suffer when creativity and innovation in research is limited. As the watchdog of the breast cancer movement, Breast Cancer Action is the only national breast cancer organization to join the ACLU's lawsuit against Myriad. We've been working for more than 20 years to put patients before profit. And Breast Cancer Action demands an end to gene patents so that women's health comes first. With that, it's my deep pleasure to turn it over to Sandra Park from the ACLU, which is doing tremendous work with their legal challenge to Myriad's patent. This legal challenge matters for women living with and at risk of breast cancer and goes far beyond breast cancer with wide-ranging international implications. We are honored to partner with the ACLU and so pleased to have Sandra here today. Sandra. Emma. There you go. <laughs> sure. Thank you so much, Karuna. And I want to thank uh, Breast Cancer Action for hosting this webinar, as well as their partnership on this important issue. Um, as previously mentioned, I'm an attorney in the National Office of the ACLU. And I represent the 20 plaintiffs that brought the litigation challenging uh, Myriad's patents, including Breast Cancer Action and Rooney. I just want to uh, talk very briefly about why the ACLU is involved in this case. Um, I often get the question about why is the ACLU bringing a patent litigation? And we, after long deliberation, decided to get involved in this issue because we think these patents raise very serious constitutional problems, which I'll talk about later. And as an attorney in the Women's Rights Project, I'm particularly concerned about their impact on women's health. Next. So I want to just say a little bit about what exactly has been patented. And here you see the top one of the patents that Myriad um, controls. This particular patent is related to the BRCA1 gene. And there are two types of patent claims that we've challenged in our lawsuit. One are claims to isolated DNA. And all that means, as defined by the patent, is DNA that's been removed from the cell. So it's DNA that encodes for the BRCA protein. And all that's been done is it's been removed from the cell. It hasn't been genetically engineered to act any differently from how it would in your body. And the way we know this is because uh, Myriad actually uses that DNA to tell you about your own genetic information. And so if that DNA, by isolating it, somehow fundamentally changed that characteristic of DNA, the Myriad would not actually be able to tell you through its test how your DNA functions in your body. The other type of claim we've challenged are claims to methods of comparing two genetic sequences. And these are extremely abstract methods. Basically, what the claims say is that they're going to be comparing um, one genetic sequence from a patient against the reference sequence, or what's considered the normal sequence. And these claims don't actually specify any type of machinery, any type of particular test that they're using. They're really claiming the abstract mental process of comparing two genetic sequences. Next. So the lawsuit that we brought is the very first legal challenge to gene patents in the United States. And we filed the case in May of 2009. And there are two primary legal arguments that are made. One is that under the Patent Act, the Supreme Court for over 100 years has recognized that laws and products of nature are not patentable. And so our fundamental argument is that DNA, whether it's isolated or not, is still a product of nature, and it embodies a law of nature because it embodies the information, uh, your genetic information. We also argue that these patents raise constitutional issues because under Article I, the Patent Clause, Congress is only authorized to issue patents where they promote the progress of science. And we have argued that these patents, unlike most patents, do not at all promote the progress of science. Because what we're talking about here are patents on the DNA itself. And that creates a block for further research and clinical practice. We've also argued that these patents violate the First Amendment. Because under the First Amendment, the 
freedom or scientific inquiry is also protected, and these patents create barriers to that kind of scientific freedom. Next. So the lawsuit was brought by 20 plaintiffs, and you'll see them listed here. And two that I just want to mention are Hay Kazazian and Arupa Ganguly, who were uh, geneticists at the University of Pennsylvania. And they were actually already providing BRCA genetic testing using a different testing method than Myriad used to obtain its patent. And so because Myriad actually obtained patent DNA itself, it was able to send a cease and desist letter and get the University of Pennsylvania lab to stop providing BRCA genetic testing services, even though the testing method was completely different. The three defendants are the Patent Office for issuing these patents, and Myriad and the University of Utah, which controls the patents. Next. So these 20 plaintiffs brought the lawsuit because they were concerned about the effects of human gene patenting. And uh, most of those, Karuna has already talked about in great detail. But one thing I just want to mention is that unlike patents on a drug or a very specific kind of test, you can't invent around a patent on a gene. Um, for example, you know, people can uh, invent around patents on drugs by inventing another drug that treats the same condition. But when you've actually patented the DNA, you block access to genetic information. And it doesn't matter whether the gene you're talking about is considered a normal gene or a mutated form of the gene or whose sample it is. Myriad's patent blocks access to all of that. Next. So the lawsuit was filed in 2009, and in 2010, we got a ruling for the first time in the United States finding gene patents invalid as products of nature. And Judge Sweet wrote, DNA represents the physical embodiment of biological information distinct in its essential characteristics from any other found in nature. It is concluded that DNA's existence in an isolated form alters neither the fundamental quality of DNA as it exists in the body, nor the information it encodes. Therefore, the patents at issue directed to isolated DNA containing sequences found in nature are unsustainable as a matter of law and are deemed unpatentable subject matter. And Judge Sweet referred to the practice of patenting so-called isolated DNA as a lawyer's trick of trying to get around the fact that you cannot patent DNA in the body. Next. So from there, Myriad appealed that ruling and went up to the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals. And at that stage, the Solicitor General, who is the top lawyer for the United States, particularly in the Supreme Court, filed an amicus brief or a friend of the court brief on behalf of the United States. And there, the Solicitor General indicated that it no longer believed that these patents are valid. And so that was a really important step in terms of our government's recognition of the invalidity of these patents. In July of 2011, though, the Federal Circuit, which consisted of a panel of three judges, um, issued a two-to-one split opinion upholding the patents on, these, uh, on the DNA. They did find most of the method claims invalid. And the reasoning that the majority used in finding that the DNA claims were valid was simply that they looked at DNA more as a chemical rather than for its biological qualities. And so they determined that once you remove it from the cell, there results some trivial chemical differences once it's out of that natural environment. And they really focused on that rather than the fact that the DNA continues to encode for the same traits as it does in your body. They also decided that they wanted to defer to the Patent Office because the Patent Office for many years has been issuing these patents, and that was something the majority thought should be respected. Next. So from there, the plaintiffs appealed to the US Supreme Court, which is the top court in the United States. And while our petition was pending, another Supreme Court case came down called Mayo versus Prometheus. And that case involved um, patents that Prometheus had that it was enforcing against the Mayo Clinic that involved um, determining how a patient metabolized a particular drug and looking at the metabolite level to determine whether that drug was being effective in terms of treatment. And the court there said that these patents are invalid because they uh, claim a law of nature. And the law of nature is simply the correlation between how a patient metabolized the drug and the drug's efficacy. It mattered not at all that the, that the method involved the drug because what was really patented was that law of nature. 
And so in light of that decision, the Supreme Court vacated the Federal Circuit decision in our case and told the court to reconsider um, the decision it had previously made. Next. So the stage we're at now, we're basically round two in front of the Federal Circuit, and the main questions are going to be, how does the Supreme Court's decision in Mayo affect Myriad? And we feel very confident that the Supreme Court's decision in Mayo bolsters our arguments, particularly because the court there really talked a lot about its concern about how patents on laws and products of nature can impede future innovation. And that's been a central argument of ours, that unlike many other patents, patents on DNA itself stands in the way of clinical practice and research. The second point that the court talked about in Mayo is that you should not be looking at what industry has relied upon in determining whether these patents should stand. So the mere fact that Prometheus had had these patents for many years and that industry thought that those patents were important should not sway the court's decision. Oral argument will be on July 20th, and so for those of you in D.C. who would like to come, the court is open to the public, and anyone who actually wants to listen to the arguments can also hear them online afterwards on the court's website. So one thing I want to um, turn to next is that these patents do not affect just breast and ovarian cancer. This is an issue that affects all of us, and for that reason, um, there's just a slide here showing the many uh, genes that have been patented, and there are many more than could fit on this slide. Um, but because so many different conditions and diseases are implicated by gene patents, uh, that many groups have weighed in. Next. And so we've been really privileged and pleased to have amicus groups um, from a wide variety of um, interests and contacts file briefs in the case. And uh, most recently, we were pleased to learn that uh, Dr. James Watson, who co-discovered DNA, um, filed a brief arguing that gene patents are invalid. So we certainly welcome their support in the litigation, and we also welcome yours. And so I next want to briefly talk about opportunities for public support. We started a campaign called Take Back Our Genes. And on the next slide, you'll see there's a Facebook page where those of you who want to keep up to date on developments and advocacy opportunities and are on Facebook are welcome to join. Next. We also have two videos that I think really compellingly tell the stories of patients and researchers who have been affected by gene patents. And I encourage you all to watch those and share those with others to better educate yourself about these issues. Next. And lastly, we have a photo campaign where we've reached out to the public to share their thoughts as well as their stories and photos about how they think about gene patents. And this is something that we hope will be a great tool for educating everybody about this issue, which unfortunately can be sometimes seen as a very technical issue, but I really think it's an important vital issue that affects all of our health. And so with that, I want to turn it over to Rooney Limery. Hi, I'd like to thank Breast Cancer Action for having me today. My name is Bernie Limery, and I'm one of the plaintiffs on this case. I'll spend a few minutes sharing my story and why I'm involved with this case. I'll start in 2005 when I was a fairly healthy 28-year-old. I had my annual physical exam that spring, which included a clinical breast exam. That summer, I found a lump. I went back to my primary care doctor and she ordered a mammogram, even though she assured me that it was probably a benign cyst because I was healthy and I was young. It was supposed to read my mammogram film because I had dense breasts, so I was also given an ultrasound. I was told that it was a benign cyst and for me to return in six months for a follow-up. I was relieved, but something kept nagging me in the back of my mind. I went back to see my primary care in the fall because it felt as if my lump was growing. She sent me to a surgeon who did an ultrasound and confirmed that my mass indeed doubled in size from 0.6 centimeters to 1.2 centimeter. My surgeon did a fine needle aspiration that day that scheduled a surgical biopsy because it was fast growing. The final needle aspiration pathology showed no signs of cancer, so I was relieved when I went in for my surgical biopsy. My post-op follow-up to make sure my incision was healing several days later was the day that my world came crashing down. That was the day I found out that I had invasive breast cancer at the age of 28. Of course, all this came as a shock because of my three negative test results. I had so many questions. 
why did I get cancer at such a young age, especially since no one in my immediate family had any type of cancer? Has the cancer spread? Will I need chemotherapy? Will I be able to work while on treatment? How will this affect me financially? Everything moved quickly, and I was lucky to have a wonderful medical team. I was able to meet with my oncologist the day after I was diagnosed, and we got the ball rolling to have tests done to hopefully answer my many questions. One of my tests my oncologist wanted me to have was the genetic testing because I was diagnosed at such a young age. I was briefed about the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes that having this mutation would increase my risk of having breast and ovarian cancer as well as it would put me in a higher risk for developing breast cancer in the other breast. Women are usually diagnosed at a younger age if they carry this genetic mutation. The test results would help me make the decision of whether or not I would need to have a single or a double mastectomy and whether or not to remove my ovaries. The test would give me significant answers, so I had the blood drawn for it. I learned that my insurance would not pay for the genetic testing and a $3,100 cost for the test was too much for me to comprehend in my whirlwind of the days during my diagnosis. It was frustrating that my cancer treatment was costing so much and even more frustrating that a test that would give me so many answers cost me thousands of dollars. I decided to focus on the cancer at hand and just move forth with a single mastectomy even though I knew I would have done a double mastectomy if my results came back positive, but I just couldn't handle the high cost for the genetic testing at that time. Besides the genetic testing, my insurance company thankfully covers the rest of the tests my oncologist ordered. All the test results came back favorable. I was stage one and cancer was not in my lymph nodes. I went ahead and had chemotherapy because my cancer was HER2 positive. I went through a single mastectomy surgery, five months of chemotherapy, a year of targeted therapy, and five years of hormone inhibitor oral medication. I switched, I switched jobs in 2007 and found out that my new insurance covered the genetic testing after a $1,500 deductible. I was thrilled because I was experiencing some pelvic pain and was afraid I had ovarian cancer. My non-cancerous breath also caused me much anxiety because every itch redness and lump made me think I had breast cancer. So the decision to get the test done, even with a high deductible, gave me hope that I would finally get the answer to the final piece of the puzzle that I was missing back from my initial diagnosis. Or so I thought. My result came back inconclusive. I tested positive for the BRCA1 with a variant of uncertain significance. Basically, it meant that Marriott cannot determine whether it was a dangerous mutation or a benign, uncommon one. This was supposed to be the final piece of my missing puzzle to decide whether or not to have a prophylactic mastectomy or not, but it only raised more questions. I called Marriott and found out that my variant was found in only two other people, both of whom are Asian. Two of us had breast cancer and the other person did not. The sample test population was not large enough for me to feel as if I truly tested positive or negative for the BRCA1 genetic mutation. I also learned that I couldn't get a second opinion because Marriott was the only company that ran the test because they owned the patent on the, on the BRCA gene. I was stunned. A company can patent genes? I also spoke to a representative and they said they were not performing extra studies regarding variants of uncertain significance. I've added zero for two regarding whether or not I should remove my other breast and whether or not I should have my ovaries removed. In 2008, I decided to be proactive and have the other breast removed. Thankfully, there were no signs of cancer in the other breast. I felt as if I bought myself some breathing room, but I wasn't out of the woods yet. I knew that ovarian cancer is considered the silent killer. I was rotating CA-125 and ultrasound but I knew that none of these tests were that reliable. I was only 33 and wasn't ready to be in complete menopause yet. I also didn't know if I wanted children, so I decided to take my chances by keeping my ovaries. I made the tough decision to have my other breast removed three years after my diagnosis, but I still have to make the difficult decision of whether or not to have my ovaries removed. In 2009, I learned about ACLU's interest in challenging Marriott's patent on the BRCA genes and felt as if I would be a strong plaintiff. 
there would be such a significant and profound impact to the medical and cancer community, the patent was uplifted. People after me would not have to go through what I went through. They would have more options. Testing would be more affordable, especially if insurance would cover it. They would be able to get a second and third opinion. Researchers would be free to test variants of uncertain significance and learn more about the genetic makeup of underrepresented populations like the Asian population. We have come so far with genetic testing, but yet we haven't. The patent stifles research. I join ACLU's fight to take back my genes when I join them as a plaintiff. I hope everyone will join me by taking back our genes. Before it's too late, I hope I will one day find the missing piece of my puzzle. Thank you, and this concludes my presentation. Thank you so much, Rooney, um, for sharing your story and, and just your struggles with gene patenting. Um, I need to take a moment, I apologize, to uh, end the presentation and bring it back up again. Um, and I apologize to everyone for that. I'll be right back up in a second. There we go. So right now I want to talk about sort of the, the next step. Uh, Sandra gave a really good picture of the history of this case and kind of where we are currently. And right now during the uh, litigation, public engagement is limited. Um, after the July 20th decision, depending on what the decision is, there may be a, a next step of introduction of legislation. And as this issue potentially moves into the legislative arena, Breast Cancer Action continues to work closely with our partners as we monitor the progress of this issue. We also continue to build public momentum by educating and also positioning our members to really take action at crucial steps in the process. Um, and right now, um, you're really doing your part to educate yourself on this uh, important issue. You could also stay up to date on what comes next by following Breast Cancer Action through our email alerts and also our newsletter. You can also follow the ACLU through their Take Back Our Genes campaign um, that Sandra mentioned, and I will um, post the uh, link again. So in a minute, we're going to be opening it up to your questions. And um, we do have some questions that people have been posting, so thank you. Please keep those coming. Um, but before we get to those questions, I just want to talk a little bit more uh, about, about how you can join Breast Cancer Action by signing news and action alert emails to keep up to date on this issue and other breast conversation about the breast cancer epidemic. You can spread the word by getting others involved themselves in this issue. And last, you can donate advocacy work, resources that um, you can tap into. So the uh, ACLU's Take Back Our Genes campaign on the screen there um, is a way that you could get involved. There's also a book called Building Genetic Medicine, which compares the establishment of the BRCA, of BRCA services in the US and Britain, and also um, speaks about lessons for the future of genetic medicine. Another resource is the Center for Genetics and Society. They're a nonprofit information and public affairs organization working to encourage responsible uses and effective societal governance of the new human genetic and reproductive technologies. And last, we collaborate with staff both at the International Center for Technology Assessment and also Friends of the Earth. And both of these are really good resources and sources of information on gene patenting. Again, I want to remind you that Breast Cancer Action relies on your support to make these webinars possible. Your individual support of our work is crucial. If you've been inspired today, please consider making a donation of $25 or more so we can continue these webinars. You can go to www.bcaction.org backslash donate. I want to give a really big thank you to Sandra for her presentation today and all the work that she and the ACLU are doing on the legal end to protect women's health, and to Rooney for sharing her personal profound story with all of us today. And now I'd like to open it up to uh, questions that you may have on the topic. So there's um, some comments and some questions, and I'm going to um, go through and make sure we can try to get all of them. Um, so the first one says, um, 
not going to be able to pronounce this, I'm pretty sure, but uh, are you working with the Bazursky Institute? Uh, they have already discovered a cure for cancer. Um, I don't know if, how relevant, but brain, breast, et cetera, wherever tumors are involved. Um, Karuna, I don't know if you are familiar with the Bazursky Institute, if that's um, somewhere that um, we've had contact with. Um, so maybe that's something offline I, I can um, speak to speak to that person. Um, another question is, is this PowerPoint available online? And yes, all of our webinars, including this one, um, are available on our website. And um, this one will be, uh, we record all of our webinars and, and the recording will be up um, in about a week. Um, and everyone who has attended the webinar and registered for the webinar will receive an email um, and in that email, there'll be a link to the, uh, where you can find it. Um, so another question. Um, well, there's a comment. Someone says, thank you all for a very informative webinar. We appreciate the, appreciate the comments and the questions. And um, someone says, would, se would sending um, specimens, I guess women's specimens, to UK or Australia be an option for women at risk, needy? Uh, are there credible institutions that offer the services? Uh, I don't know if anyone, if any yeah. presenter feels they can handle that. Sure. Well, I'll, I think there are a few questions relating to uh, testing in other countries and the extent to which patent protection exists in other countries. Um, so I'll, I'll just address all of those issues. Um, so one thing to know is, in general, you know, when you've obtained a, obtained a patent in one country, you often um, can then seek patent rights in other countries. And so for that reason, uh, the lawsuit's very important in terms of determining U.S. patent policy because that will have an effect internationally. Um, as to the specific patents that Myriad has obtained, uh, it's a pretty interesting history internationally what's happened. Um, they did seek patent rights on BRCA1 and 2 in Canada, in Europe, and in Australia. And um, in Canada, they did obtain them, as well as in Australia, they obtained them. But they uh, licensed their rights to other entities. Um, and for a variety of reasons, um, those other entities did not exercise or enforce their patent rights for some time. Although in Australia, um, after initially saying that, you know, they're going to they, were going to give the patent as a gift to the people of Australia, the company that licensed the rights then changed their minds and decided that they wanted to enforce their patents. Um, and so that, that pat those patents have been caught up in litigation following that. In Europe, um, there was actually some legal challenges brought to the patents, but not on the grounds that we've talked about. They were uh, more on technical grounds. And um, one of the things that was sort of interesting to know is with respect to BRCA2, um, there was actually you know, a typo mistake in one of the patent applications. And so for that reason, uh, Myriad's rights were not, um, Myriad did not get the full scope of rights that they have in the US. So um, in most of those uh, con other countries, there are BRCA genetic testing services that are provided by independent and, you know, by independent labs as well as governmental labs um, because they don't have to face the same risk of patent infringement as in the U.S. Now, in terms of actually getting tested in those other countries, I've heard of patients choosing to do that, um, Americans going to um, other countries to get their samples tested, uh, particularly when they're seeking confirmatory opinions, um, that does happen. But of course, there's, you know, a resource question also with that kind of, um, you know, with seeking that kind of testing, whereas we would hope that inexpensive and accessible testing could be um, provided here in the U.S. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Um, there, are, there are no more questions. It, it seems like we um, have been able to answer everyone's questions. So with that, I want to thank everyone for all their really thoughtful questions and comments. And um, if you would like to follow up with any questions you weren't able to ask, you can do that at info at bcaction.org. And I want to thank everyone for attending today. And as I mentioned before, we will be sending an email with a short survey where you can provide feedback on this webinar. 
thank you very much and have a wonderful rest of your day.